You are listening to the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. This is Mind Pump. Now, today's episode, we answered live questions from listeners and viewers. They called in. We actually got to coach them over the phone or over Zoom, so you get to listen to that part of the episode uh, at about 41 minutes. So the first 41 minutes was our intro portion where we talk about current events, studies. We mentioned our sponsors. Let me give you a rundown of today's mm-hmm. podcast episode. We started out by talking about tights for lifting. That's right. You can wear tights while you lift weights. And apparently, it's got performance-enhancing benefits. They don't just feel good to wear them, right, Justin? Yeah, yeah they, they they have some other purpose, apparently. Yeah. Um, then we talk about Apple VR glasses coming out. Uh, they're going to be really expensive. They might be pretty awesome. Who knows? It might change the world. Then we talked about uh, how Medical News Today talked about one of our sponsors and one of their articles, the Chili Pad and Uller. So these products heat or cool your bed with water. So they don't use, uh, there's no EMFs, there's no wires uh, in the bed. It's all water cooled. But you can adjust the temperature of your bed to give you optimal sleep. And some of their products have two sides. So you and your spouse can choose different temperatures. We love their stuff. And because you listen to Mind Pump, you actually get hooked up. Here's what you got to do. Go to chilitechnology.com. That's C-H-I-L-I, technology.com forward slash Mind Pump and get an exclusive offer for Mind Pump listeners only. There's a discount Mm. code on that page, by the way, when you pull it up. Then we talk about the characteristics of serial killers. One of them is kind of weird. Then we talk about the stock market and uh, real estate asset inflation, some speculation there. We talked about the keto diet and influenza or other respiratory diseases. Really interesting study done on mice. We talked about how San Francisco is changing the name of 44 of their schools because, you know, it's the best way to spend their money. That's just what's happening. Uh, Then we talked about Bishop Barron. Recently, I interviewed Bishop Barron. We got some comments on it, and so we talked about all that and the evolution of ideas. We talked about who invented the most disgusting food of all time, Hawaiian pizza. What's wrong with you people? (laughs) We talked about how one of our heroes when we were kids just died recently uh, from his battle with cancer, Screech. Uh, So uh, rest in peace there. Shout out Screech. Uh, Then we gave a a workout update. We're all working out real hard right now, trying to get super fit and motivated. Justin talked about how he liked to use Organifi's Pure before he podcasts because it makes him feel sharper. Oh, yeah. Organifi's Pure has got 11 superfoods. Uh, they also have lion's mane in there, baobab fruit, ginger, uh, all things that help your gut and can help you think better. I love uh, Organifi's products. They have lots of different things. They're all vegan. Go check them out. Go to Organifi.com, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump at checkout if you want to get 20% off. Uh, and then we talked about the worst natural disasters, or at least the ones we're most afraid of. After that, we got into answering some really cool questions. We talked to Heather from California, Adam from Ohio, Chris from Minnesota, and then Angela from California. By the way, here's a shout out to her husband, John, who adopted her daughter, Sienna, 12 years ago. This is their adoption anniversary, I believe, so congratulations. Um, Also, all month long, we have a February special for what's called our Phase 2 Bundle. So this includes two very popular, effective workout programs. MAPS Performance, which trains you to move better, improve your mobility, become more athletic. And MAPS Aesthetic, which is a body sculpting, body building program. So when you get both programs, essentially what you're getting is a body that performs well and looks awesome uh, at the beach. So aesthetics and performance. Both programs about three or four months long. So if you follow them back to back, it's a long Workout cycle, all planned out for you. Workout demos, exercise demos, everything you need. So you're looking at about six to eight months of expert workout programming. Now, normally when you buy both programs, it'll cost you almost $300 or over $300. Right now, get them both in this phase two bundle for $79.99. That's it. You get both programs, lifetime access. You also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. Go check them out. Go learn more or go sign up at Maps. February.com. That's the word maps, M A P S F E B R U A R Y.com. Adam. What? I got to give you credit, dude. Oh, well, wait Officially. a second. Wait a second. Hold this on. This is a trick. No, Hold on. No. This is a trick for sure. Something no, coming right me. behind you've it. You've been stealing my credit for the last four years, man. Wow. Come on, dude. 
<laughs> you know what? That's why I don't compliment you. <laughs> All I'm those not facts are just like get no, no, right away. Me, no, no, tell no, me. I forgot. Tell me. Stroke my ego, please. That's really weird. Tell me. Tell me. No, you know what? You, uh, I made fun of you early on. Okay. You never do that. About wearing tights uh, on your legs. Oh. For leg workouts. Yeah. The 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 you what are they, did. What are they, compression pants. Compression pants. I still make yeah, fun of you. Don't, yeah. don't say tight. Justin's still on the Yeah, I'm on the still fence. Makes fun. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I used to make fun of you like, oh gosh, what are you stupid, whatever? And you're like, oh no, it feels great. Uh, anyway, uh I've been doing it now for a while because I read some studies and uh they help with recovery, inflammation, and performance. And I will say, they definitely do. I don't like working out my legs without wearing them now. Yeah. yeah. It's like the pump I get is better. Uh, it's your little thunder vest for the, your thunder it's, thighs. That's what it is. The mu- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it keeps everything. I mean, it does. Studies do show it reduces inflammation, speeds up recovery, blah, blah, blah. But you have to actually wear them for longer than the workout in the study. So people uh, okay. would train in them and then wear them the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, or some people wear them at night when they go to sleep. I can't do that. It's a little little too little too tight. Yeah. Well, I got to confess. So I, I used to wear them for football all the time. So, mm-hmm. yeah. It, it, I mean, we called it a girdle, whatever, but it was basically just like tights that you'd wear under every, all back your pads. Back when you were a cheerleader? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Back when I was on the sidelines. Yeah, get them, boys. <laughs> you were a base, right? Not a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm too handsome for a base. You imagine sorry. just the flyer? Yeah. No. Move, get I was away. leading the chairs. <laughs> He's coming Let's down. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you guys see that? Um, Justin wore baggy sweats. Hey, I like these tights. <laughs> Those are actually baggy sweats, Justin. What are you talking about? <laughs> Those aren't supposed to be tight. Did you guys see um, Apple is uh, getting ready to release their VR glasses? Oh, yeah? These things are supposed to run like six to $10,000. What's the difference? Like, wow. What's their, their pitch in terms of that versus Oculus? Or the, uh, I don't know, dude. I don't so know. So do you wear them all the time? No. Or do you wear them just to play games? No, no, no. I think you would just wear them, uh, wear them for games or whatever you're you're plugging into. But I, have you guys been seeing some of the ads that are around VR and stuff coming around that are looking pretty cool? No, Six I to haven't. ten thousand dollars. Yeah, it's crazy. Going to be expensive. Wow. Yeah, they better be. Well, awesome. they always yeah they always try to make their product like the Escalade of everything. You know? Yeah. Well, I think uh, the I mean, let's be honest. What market do you think's gonna just crush in the VR department? Porn, dude. Pornography. Right. Hundred percent. So. Duh. If you're gonna spend six to ten grand on glasses, we know what you're doing. <laughs> we know. <laughs> we know what you're doing there, Bob. We know exactly what's going on. Yeah, here with the VR. We're glasses. on to you. No, I. You know, I've done. Uh, I've seen VR before, and it gives me vertigo a little bit. Yeah, the closest. I mean, I went to one of those conventions where they were displaying uh, VR, and they're trying to include some fitness and stuff. It was interesting, but the the one that I tried, I was on this gyro sort of contraption, so I had to like lean on top of it in a prone position, and then I started moving. Like I would just make these slight movements, and I was flying on some glider, and I started to get a little bit like sick. It was it was trippy. It does. It gives you vertigo. Yeah. I mean, you're looking around. You're like, Oh, you get really just, immersed in it. It's, that's it's, what I mean. Your yeah. brain has a trouble, like uh, I guess, figuring out if you're actually really doing that. So, or aside from your porn prediction, where do you see this? Like, where do you see it first? Like, really blowing up. Besides that, okay. We, mm-hmm. we well, video agree. games, video games. First. Yeah, I think video games. Okay, now aside from that, because uh, those are obvious, I would say. Yeah, it's right? obvious. Uh, a- do you guys think VR glasses would be good for virtual meetings? So, you know how, like, right now everybody does Zoom. So, you're uh-huh. going to do a meeting or we do an interview and we're using Zoom. Do you think VR glasses would be good for that? Where now I can look to my left, there's Adam, I mean, I think it would, Justin for our it. company, it would be great because then I know you two assholes wouldn't be on your phone when we're in a meeting. Mm. Yeah, you'd, <laughs> you'd have these goggles on your I'm gonna face. I'm going to start taking a picture of this guy. He's always <laughs> on his phone, like, talking shit. He's the worst. Um, yeah, <laughs> seriously. Um, yeah, no, like, so I also think it could be for educational purposes. So maybe you're you're sort of immersed in, in like, some history class. Like, you're going through and, like, looking at stuff. I don't know. Didn't they, they do might some- get creative. Didn't they do something with sporting events where you put them on and you're sitting like, oh, yeah. uh, you know, courtside? Yeah, I think Oculus was the one that did that, right? So they have the NBA courtside. But you know what? I I haven't heard a lot about it. I, like, I haven't heard anybody talking about it. So I don't know how good it is. I don't know if it panned out the way they were they they thought. So the NBA right now has a view that I hate when they a camera that they cut to. And I think it is that courtside view. And... uh when you're in person, I don't know. Maybe it's just different when you're in person and you're sitting there. That's awesome. 
Uh, but when you're when you're watching on TV, I kind of like the the bird's eye view, or I, and I don't know the technical name of the the angle or the view that they they shoot most of the game from because mm-hmm. you can see the whole court. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I can see the play developing. I can see the ball moving on the other side. When they drop it down to this view, as if you were someone sitting on the sideline watching the game, it sucks because if something's on the opposite side going on, you you miss. Yeah, it's it. limited. Yeah, it's very limited. So I, I'm I don't know. I'm not a fan of that. So well, far. however good VR glasses are going to get, hmm. um, I would. Assume assume that Elon Musk's Neuralink is going to blow it out of the water when that becomes a thing. Did you guys see that they have a monkey Where playing? are they with that? Well, okay, I was just going to tell oh, you, right? Okay. So they have a monkey playing video games right now with a Neuralink. <laughs> so they've hooked up a monkey's brain to Neuralink, and he's now, the monkey is now operating a video game by, yeah, through thought. So that's so, where they're at. With so when that. they do studies like that, I always wonder, like, how how accurate is this? Is that's it like because they did, didn't they do a thing where monkeys picked stocks and he did better? Yeah. So is it like really is he critically thinking <laughs> to pick the stocks, or he's just randomly it's picking and just chance. out? And is it the game like is he? Like, no, I think you ever that, play with a button pusher? You know, I feel like you would be a button pusher. Yeah. If we play games. Me, yeah, no, it was yeah. just like smash it with yeah. your fist. You just, and you just push, push all the buttons, buttons as fast as no, you can. No, Sometimes no, you no. win. You no, know? no, no, no. Half circle, A, B, select, start. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's a Nintendo. Okay, know. okay. So anyway, um, no, I think what it is is that there's a particular game or series of movements that the monkey would have to do for them to realize that it's intentional, not random, uh-huh. and they're able to show that. Really? You know what's funny about this? Hmm. This is what cracks me up. Right? People are like. They're spying on me through my app, you know? And then Elon's like, I'm going to put something in your brain. They're like, I'll buy that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that yeah, that trips, sounds better. That always trips me out. Yeah, it's weird because I know they've been working a lot on neural feedback. And so just based off of tracking of your eyes and everything else and, and sort of predicting like where you want to go, uh, they, they've developed games and things around that. But now that's like obviously a whole nother level. Have you Now, have you seen the studies? This is the creepy stuff, right? Have you seen the studies where they're able to... A, hook someone up to some kind of measurement device. I don't know exactly what they're using, if it's an fMRI machine or something else. And the person thinks of a picture or a face, and the computer is able to pixelize what the person is thinking of. So like if I'm thinking of your face, yeah. then the, without telling anybody, the computer can show what I'm visualizing. Or they're able to pick up what people are dreaming. Or they say that technology exists where- You know, I just realized what? magicians are going to go out of business. Why? <laughs> Why? Dude, people are going to- No. They're going to know what you're thinking. <laughs> they're going to know everything, you know? <laughs> I, I knew where that bird came yeah, from. Yeah. All your so tricks. Right. <laughs> yeah, I just saw that. No, but how weird would that be if you're- Like, you go to the airport, you know, instead of putting your bags through the thing or whatever. Yeah. Like, put your uh, your head in this machine real quick. So that's what- I like to speculate on the things that you think might happen because of it. Like, what, what industry is going to pop up because of- something like VR what's going to what's going to change and be so different that we don't have today That's- dude it, what was that black mirror episode where they uh, like they they recorded everything that they saw and so the husband and wife got an oh, argument oh yeah and they can rewind back and be yeah, like through no. his eye yeah he could like zoom super zoom in or or he could rewind and like go back yeah, and so replay it's like the if day. you could read someone's mind imagine having you know a conversation with your spouse you know honey is, is something wrong no no i'm fine and you're like oh you're irritated because i chew loudly that's weird. Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, I yesterday when we 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 stopped by Best Buy on the way up, right, and uh, Eli went in with Doug, and we picked up those those DJI drones, and I really think that we're not far from because these things already have like tracking and autopilot yeah. and like you know they, it, it's like literally we're I don't know maybe a year or two away from this where you can these things will just. You can have them hover above you and just track you all day long. And so that's kind of like that, right? Where you could have, and you sounds ridiculous. Like who would want to record their day? All day? Well, you already have fucking kids doing this right now on Instagram. Like that's a doing this all and YouTube, right? Like mm-hmm. documenting their days every single day. Like it'd be so much easier to just have this thing that automatically, boop, as soon as you pop up, it hovers and kind of follows you around. And then you decide uh, of that content, what you want to put out to you know the public and everybody else, but for personal use, you'll have a log of every single day of your life. And we've seen day. influencers in the wild, so we know that's not going away. Yeah, you know, like no, <laughs> nobody's checking these people. Oh, so now they got drones. It's just going to get ridiculous. Yeah, everyone's so important. You know, hey, yeah. you want to watch my movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you want to watch? Thursday? Look what I did today. You want to see what right. happened on Thursday? This was cool. Look, I threw the paper in the garbage from yeah. far away. Uh, <laughs> it went right in. So crazy. It's all hovering on yeah. it in the bathroom. Yeah, and I put it up on my page on Instagram. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm so real. Day to day. I'm so authentic. Maybe I'm just not there yet for that technology. You 
know what technology is cool right now that I'm that I'm excited about? We just got our Oolers in, right? Chili technology is where it's at. The fact that you can Hell control yeah. your wife's climate and yours simultaneously in the, in the, in this, the same This is the bed. granddaddy. This is the one on yeah. both sides. Fuck VR, bro. Yeah. This is where it's at. Yeah. It's, <laughs> hey, did you see medical news uh, today? It's a, a site that I'll fa- uh, follow sometimes. They listed the Chili Pad and Uller as some of the best, uh, you know, mattress cooler or heater products around. So they did like a big evaluation. And is it because it does? It's not using any like uh, e- EMFs, right? It's it's all water. Is that? Uh, why? I think it was because it was because of the range of temperatures, how you can control it from your app, yeah. the fact that it's water cooled, um, and then the feature that I think is the most valuable. I know I know a lot of people are. I don't know if people are actually using this, but I find this extremely valuable. I set it so that because here's what happens to wake like, you up. Yeah, yeah. If you're in bed and let's say it's set at sixty degrees, I don't like, do that. I need to do that, dude. Try it. I know you've been saying that for a while with your alarm clock thing, and I just oh, it bro, works. If it's like you're simulating nature, so you're in bed and you want to wake up at seven, set it so that it starts to warm up like at six thirty at like six thirty six forty five. And here's what happens half the time. Half the time you just wake up. Yeah. You're like, oh, I feel like I'm whatever. Just don't do lukewarm and you'll pee your pants. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. That, that yeah, might happen. Awesome. I don't know. Justin's that- like, I tried this. <laughs> but, it it happens wife. to people, I swear. It's, it's backfired. Uh, either one of you were bedwetters. Did you guys ever do that when you were kids? No. no. Yeah, I mean, they, either. You know, there's not. A ge- I've been awkward if you, I said yes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know that they can, they, they, there's a genetic component to that? Do you know that? Really? They, yeah, they can. There's, they find some genes that are connected to bedwetting. Wow. What? I know, right? Well, I've heard it's also connected to uh, serial killers. Really? Yeah. What? I don't know. I'm that serious. They, Google it, Doug. You guys and your conspiracy theories. It's That's not, not a conspiracy. conspiracy theory. This what is were just we doing last night at That's dinner? Science. They associate like Eli uh, certain characteristics. Dinner last night, and you like right away. Justin knew had had. The oh yeah. Well, it was about uh, Lyme disease. Lyme disease. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah and it, it. Well, it's just because there's speculation because it was all like an East Coast disease initially, and there was this island, that, Plume Island, or Plume, Plume. Yeah, Plume Island. Who? Uh, Plum Island. Plume Island. I don't know. But yeah, there was lots of. Uh, Biomedical experiments there, and so like people speculate that it might have started there on an animal, and then uh, you know tran- transferred over to a tick, and then it spread out from there. There it is, Doug. Yeah. Did you find it? I did. So there's three things that are linked to these serial kill- killers. Let me guess. Hold on. Uh, killing animals. Yes. Yes. Wetting the bed. Yes. Yes. And being male. Uh, maybe. Well, okay. but probably. No. But obsession with fire setting. Yes, pyro. Oh, yeah. That was the other one. Wow, that's, that's interesting. That's crazy because I, I used to love yeah, setting bedwetting. things on fire, but I, I didn't do the other stuff. I know oh, it's, it's strange. <laughs> yeah, I guess you have to have the trifecta. Does it? Yeah, t- does it say the triad? Does it say why, Doug? Does it say why the why? The, I mean, obvious the pyro thing to me and killing a, a small animals is very obvious to me. Killing that, animals just seems obvious to me. Right, right. If you caught your kid like torturing an animal. You'd have to have a meeting with your wife real quick. Be like, all right, yeah. Like, what are we gonna do? Yeah, this He's is gonna kill people. This is a problem. Yeah. Did we? We need. Maybe we need to ground him. Yeah. How many? Yeah. How many parents do you think that knew that ahead of time? Do you think there were the parents of, of serial killers knew? Bro, when you mm. when it, that when I watched like that, you document- know your children so well, right? You guys feel like you could tell if yeah. like. Bad behavior. He's, like a, I, he's an odd bird. Yeah, you know? no, I feel like, and if I watched that documentary. Remember that documentary I told you guys about where that woman, uh, she came up with a multiple personality mm-hmm. uh, thing or whatever. She studied a lot of these killers, okay? It's a combination of genetics and very strong, severe environmental factors. So, like, they had terrible abuse as children, terrible parents. So, I think, you know, uh, a Asking a serial killer's parents, like, "Hey, did, you know, do you th- do you ever think that you know beating your kids and you know abusing them or whatever, whatever, make them a serial killer?" Uh, you see what I'm saying? No. I don't necessarily. I don't. I don't think. I think it's pretty rare to happen in a kid who grows up in a well-adjusted, happy home. Mm. You know, even what's his name? Who was the the serial killer that at the time everybody's like, "Oh, he's so handsome. He seems so normal." Jeffrey Dahmer. No, was it Dahmer or Bundy? Yeah, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. Oh yeah, Bundy so, was a good looking. So the, the 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 story was that Ted Bundy had a normal childhood. Not true. Not mm. true. He had a, an abusive, uh, mm-hmm. you know, childhood uh, growing up, and so they think that's some of the reasons why he did his thing. You oh, guys, yeah. um, you got a little uh, left turn here. You guys are you guys watching stocks right now? Are you, I mean, with yeah, everything going it. on with the. Game stuff, Reddit stuff. Game stuff. Yeah, 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 and everything else going on. Are you? Are you? Yeah. What are your? What's your family saying? I want to know because they're all tied into this. stuff. Oh, they think they're just like, man, this is inflated. Everything's inflated. Mm. Now they're starting to finally say that it's that's doing that. Really? Yeah. 
Yeah. So I mean, what I mean, what can we ask? What they're doing with their money? Are, are they they that's what they do for a living? Are they are they starting to protect themselves? How are they are they pulling some money out? Are they going to leave it in? And, I think the classic things that you do, you hedge with, uh, you know, things that tend to do well when stocks do bad. So like gold, Bitcoin. Now people are doing Bitcoin. Uh, maybe stocks that are really well established that pay dividends, you know, stuff like that. Less speculation. But I mean, trying to predict when a bubble's going to pop, like, good luck, you know? Yeah. And that's, I think, that the, the challenge is because you want to ride the bubble before it pops. So, like, when do you pull out? You know mm, what I mean? How I long know, is it going to go? Know. And continue. It's so interesting though with this, like what's going on with Reddit and with you know Robinhood and this ability to buy these like partial shares. I just feel like it's opened the door for a whole a whole new percentage of the population that didn't really exist before totally. for stocks. And so it's kind of hard to gauge that, right? Like, is it really a bubble or is this more the new norm? Because now X there's an you know millions more people that are buying stocks that would not have been buying stocks just 10 years ago. I think it's a bubble just because the amount of uh, the statistic, this is a real statistic now, 40% of any every dollar ever created in history. I know, I know. So as long as we've had the dollar, okay, 40% of all dollars ever created were created last year. Mm -hmm. So that to me says asset uh, inflation. But yeah, back to what you're saying, here's what's interesting. Now, because what's happening is these big hedge fund billionaires, they're getting screwed they're getting squeezed out of their shorts by these Reddit, you know, investors or whatever. Is this still happening? Is there other yeah. examples? They're doing. They're trying to go after different things now. Silver yeah. now, right? And it's like, how do you uh, stop them? Right? How do you stop them? Right. So now mainstream media is saying, oh, if these Reddit, you know, investors don't stop messing around, they could cause one of the biggest stock market crashes of all time. I'm like you fuckers, <laughs> you fuckers. <laughs> of course, like, they're going to say that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the speculation, right? That everyone's going to get nervous about this, which I think is kind of normal to see. Like, yeah. that's kind of weird, right? So, uh, I think a lot of people start pulling out, especially if you've k crushed it the last year and a half in stocks. It's like, okay, maybe instead of trying to keep continue to ride this, maybe I'll just I'll pull. Well, out what it is ways. is if these big investors pull out, if they say, you know what, I don't want to be in the market right now because these guys are screwing with us, mm -hmm. they don't pull out like you know a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. These guys are pulling out like hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. Yeah, that could definitely that would cause, shake it up. Yeah, that could. And, but then hey, everything's on sale, then you should buy. Oh yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, but you know if you're it, I, and I'm with you on the because I think it's just it's mind boggling to think that we've printed almost half the money. Uh, this last year. I mean, that's just crazy. So uh, that causes asset inflation. Does it necessarily cause a bubble though? A bubble is something that is going to pop and is like artificially inflated or because of sp other other reasons that cause it. When you, when you uh, print that much money, I almost feel like, and I, of course, whatever comes, goes up must come down. Like I, I think we will see uh, the flattening out of the real estate market, the stock market and, and, and a dip. But I don't, I don't see a, a massive crash. I see a new norm. I see a new norm. Uh, for you know, that's exactly what they said before 2008. That's literally exactly what they said. Yeah, but we're, you're talking about a whole different situation right well, now. Well, okay, you're right, but the fundamentals are the same. And what I mean by that is bubbles happen when you have malinvestment, right? So what is malinvestment? It's taking resources, investing them in places that, especially when you have more resources that are not due to increased production, better efficiency it's just money mm -hmm. doesn't it's not tied to more production well that's your efficiency. point when you're talking about stocks right like what about Anything. real estate well no real estate then that's tied to something that's tied to property it's tied to land no and the money to buy it isn't that's what i'm saying so so what happens is if the fundamentals aren't there if the efficiency is not there the production is not there you just have more money competing for fewer products and eventually that malinvestment catches up it's called a market correction and when that happens then you start to see kind of that chain of events that starts to happen where you see these corrections, these big corrections. Yeah, my, my argument to that as far as a malinvestment with real estate is wh how things have changed since 08. Like, uh, I don't know what the percentage is, and I, re I remember reading this in an article somewhere, but it's it's a lot, most, a majority of all loans that, uh, that people have been given since 08 are, you know, 20% down with, and you got to have AAA credit to get into these. We don't have all these. We don't have all these garbage loans that we had before. So, and then that was back in 09. So, if you bought your house, okay, now if you bought it right now in the rise, maybe, right? But if you bought your house three years or before that time, you have you're sitting on depending on what part of the country you're in, 
you know, hundred good equity. Hun- yes, yeah. a lot of equity, and w- in addition to your twenty percent you put down. So you got to keep that in mind that if a bank sees that, and and by the way, banks do not want to foreclose on properties. That's a headache for them. They do not. They're not in the business of repossessing people's property. Sure. They, don't, they don't want to deal with that. They don't want to. But they're not in the real estate business, and they don't need. To, they don't want to sell properties. That's their last resort. There's they want. Interest. They want your interest. They want to just keep you paying, and so. They have all this leeway with these people that may be defaulting right now on how to handle that. Yeah, but what happens when uh, people, everyday people, are having trouble paying rent? What happens when governments stay in, step in and say, "We're going to have a moratorium or whatever you call it, we halt rent. Nobody has to pay, but you can't kick them out." Mm. What happens in that scenario? Now it starts to become a problem. Now here's the thing. Yeah, but if, we haven't seen massive increases in rent. We've anything we've actually seen a decrease or a plateau in that. We're not seeing that. So even though housing prices are inflated, right, so what cap s- rates are diminishing and the 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 rent rates are not going up dramatically. So what does that tell you, right? That tells you that people are speculating on the price of property because they have more cash, more money. I, I mean Well, I mean it, what it tells me is what I'm the way I think about it is that 40% of all money in, in circulation right now was printed in the last year. Therefore, you have one of two choices. Either the dollar is going to be worth a lot less and it's going to mm-hmm. start to diminish or crash or price massive yeah, price fluctuation or, or inflation. You see in assets and in goods. Yeah. So th- that to me is- the- oh, It's a good hedge. It is because mm. it, also if you have a fixed mortgage and there's inflation, let's say the dollar loses value- but you have a 3% 30-year interest rate, when inflation happens, fixed debt is wonderful. Right. Now your payments, your $2,000 a month payment or whatever is now, it's like paying $1,000 mm-hmm. right. a month. It's fixed, right. right? What you don't want to do is those adjustable loans when inflation hits because then interest rates you know, go through the roof. And that's yeah. what I think is driving the, the housing market right now. I don't think it's a like a, a bubble like we saw you before. You smart investors. Yeah, I think it's a lot of people who see the writing on the wall, may have may have had, you know, a few hundred thousand or millions parked in banking accounts, CDs, you know, investment portfolios and they're like, "Wait a second, instead of me doing that, I'm going to pull some of that out, grab some of these properties right now that are going to be probably 2, 3x yeah. the value in a decade." So Well, mm-hmm. assets are always good when when money starts to lose its value cuz it helps, right? Having cash, that's a bad... What a terrible situation, too, to put people in a position where saving is losing. Yeah. yeah. Like, what, know, what the hell? This is crazy. Yeah, what the hell's going on? You get punished for that. Backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, health here. Uh, read some interesting studies on respiratory diseases and diet and how it affects respiratory diseases. There was an interesting study they did on mice, and they found that when they put mice on a ketogenic diet, they fared much better with the flu, with influenza. Mm. And so now they're looking at keto diets as a potential way to mitigate symptoms of respiratory disease. I don't know about anything with COVID, um, but uh, Mm. I do find it interesting. And then it made me think, like, I wonder if this is an evolutionary thing because Mm. the flu has been, I mean, we have, we know for sure the flu has been around for 500 years, but we, we also know that like Hippocrates wrote about a flu-like disease in 400 BC or something like that. So for thousands of years, we've been dealing probably with the flu and it hits in the winter and humans tend to eat how in the winter when not with, you know, modern yeah, food, meats, but right, you yeah, know, all fats, you're not going to eat meats and nuts. Yeah. You're going to be eating more fat, probably fasting more, more protein, probably less carbohydrates because less plants grow. Mm. So kind of interesting speculation, right? Um, What's your thoughts on it? I mean, what do you think? I, you know, I think it might be, I mean, look, uh, going really low carbohydrate, running off ketones is anti-inflammatory. It might prevent the Mm. cytokine storm that they say that that COVID could cause. So I think that there's something there, um, but we need, you know, evidence. And the reason why I was looking this up is because you guys know that I've, I've really cut my carbohydrate intake. Um, and it's, it's crazy. Every time I do it, it's like such a shift. I can totally feel. I dropped like four, almost five pounds of water in a few days. Right, right. That's it. Just three days, five pounds of water off my body. Yeah, from doing something like now, that. Now, do you notice a, a massive decrease in your energy and strength? You know what I did? So you know, we inter- when I interviewed uh, uh, Rob Wolf, yeah, he talked about sodium. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm gonna give it a shot and really focus on because I don't eat processed food. So I'm like, I'm gonna eat. A lot more sodium. I'm going to take his uh, element electrolyte. I'm going to drink. I'm going to add more salt to things. Make sure I eat like bacon, which I know is naturally high in sodium. 
and uh, I notice more energy. Yeah, mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna start trying that because uh, I, I wanted to start like cutting down and cutting down on on carbohydrates a bit uh, carbohydrates a bit more aggressively. But uh, I haven't tried to do that, and he made a lot of sense when he brought that up. So yeah, I'm gonna give that a shot. Yeah, I'm behind so, you guys, I've only done it once, and I don't like to talk about stuff until I've done it a handful of times sure. to prepare it. But so far, so good. So yeah. I'm having Jessica do the same thing because she breastfeeds, yeah. and she's noticing that she's more milk. That I was most interested in that. Yeah. I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah. So, but I mean, I, I've also heard you know like. Uh, carnivore diet advocates mm -hmm. they talk a lot about uh, upping their salt intake and feeling better mm -hmm. so probably something to it i don't know i noticed i noticed for myself like i worked out this morning and we're at altitude uh because we're up in in Truckee right now and um i still had a decent workout and it was legs normally legs would Crush waste you me, right here oh yeah especially at altitude mm -hmm. and i felt okay and i'm i've had very little carbs uh, you know, maybe 60 grams or less a day for the last Four days. And by now, I would no notice like a loss, yeah, in performance. So. Hey, Justin, what do you think about the uh, the forty four schools in San Francisco? They're going to be changing their names. <laughs> Why are you going to put this on me, dude? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not I, interested in what Sal has to say, but I'm yeah, sure you I'm, not, I'm not. I'm right? not. I thought I saw your name on one of the petitions. That's why I brought yeah. it up. I thought, yeah, that you. Were I did see that. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what they're changing the names to, but I. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of uh, uh, Lincoln and Washington and those, you know, founding father names being uh, eliminated from a lot of uh, schools and a lot of other monuments and things in the country. And uh, the, I can't say that I support that. I think it's a silly uh, use of public resources. That's what I think. I think you got schools that need help. And they're like, hey, everybody, we're going to help you. We're yeah. going to spend money on we're changing the name. We're focusing on like too much nuanced nonsense. Like yeah. let's make, okay, if we're not even in school yet. Can we can we open the schools and let the kids be like regular kids again? Can we start there oh, what, what before is, we do all this other stuff? What, give me the update too. What where are you guys? What's going on with the kids right now? Uh, private schools, uh, from what I know, are, are reopening. Public schools are taking a little longer. Um, I know in some areas the teachers' unions are protesting and uh, and don't want to be open. Um, it might have to do with the fact that they get a paycheck no matter what. I don't know. Just speculation. But mm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that that seems to be happening in some places in the country. But I know here in California. They're trying to start reopening. Uh, Gavin Newsom, the governor, had this just remarkable uh, change of mind. A very quick yeah, change just, of mind. Just magical. Yeah. Are, I know you were following his recall. How far How far away is he from that? Last Dude. I saw it was like 200,000 uh, signatures away from That's nothing. being it's, 2 it's, million. It's going to probably be on the ballot. Yeah. And then will he get recalled? That's the big question. Will, yeah. he will, some, will we vote to recall him? But it's, it's hopefully, <laughs> dude. He, he's got people in his party that are like distancing themselves from him because he's becoming a little bit of a political, like you know, kryptonite. Yeah, he's got, he's got nothing left to stand on. So I mean, all of his ideas have already like come and gone, and uh, they've proven themselves to be uh, not so effective. Now, are are we in our own little bubble here, and that that just how you guys feel or we feel? And uh, have you met? I think anybody it's on both sides. To be are honest. you guys? Are you guys? Have you met anybody who's a fan of what he's doing? You know, uh, no, but I, I know some people like do like they're hoping a lot of these shutdowns and things were gonna like eliminate uh you know COVID and help us to get back to normalcy and all that and i totally understand that uh but uh, it's just not proving to be effective Dude. And so now what do we do we got like we just destroyed you know our economy and in in livelihoods for a lot of people out there for small business yeah, here's let me let me tell you something here's the beauty of how uh part of the beauty of how america is organized right we have states States can enact different policies, to, you know, of their own, right? And very different from each other. So we've had a long enough time now to compare states that had strict lockdown to those that had much looser lockdowns or opened up much sooner. And comparative states like Texas, California, in some ways you can compare, or Florida, very populated. They all have big, you know, populated metropolitan areas. And you look at them now after we've had this for a year and you can start to see did it make a big difference? And the data says no, not very effective. Yeah. So, uh, so they they were kind of like an ineffective way of of, of helping. When did that yeah. news come out? Did that just come out recently that it's ineffective? Like, this what? is what we're starting to see now. They're starting to piece things together and speculate. It's still very political to discuss because you still have both sides saying, "Oh no, you know it's right," or "Oh no, it's wrong." But right. just look at the numbers. You look at the numbers and you you can see like. It didn't really make it. It seems like it didn't make a big difference. The problem is we don't know what would have happened had we not done it or had other places done it. 
mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So you could just compare state to state uh, and see what, what that kind of looks like. Speaking of uh, you know, kind of stuff that's a little controversial, the Bishop Barron episode went up. Lots of amazing feedback. Well, that I was always, a great episode. Great episode. I always find it interesting, though, how uh, episodes on spirituality can sometimes trigger people, mm-hmm. which I find a, a little fascinating because yeah. – it's like people are so ready to just because yeah, it's coming. You from- know what though? I don't. I disagree with that. I don't. I don't get that sense. I get it when you bring someone like Bishop Barron who is talking about Christianity. I don't feel like I got that from Paul Checks. I don't feel like I got that from Aubrey Marcus. I don't feel like we got that from Don DePondi. Sanjay uh, Rawal. Yeah, I mean, all talked about spirituality. All have different. Uh, uh, philosophies and ideologies yeah, around Buddhism God and, or shaman, shamanic practices or whatever. Yeah, ayahuasca shit. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, you're talking about uh, all these different these different people that talk about spiritual practices that are very very different. Um, I I don't recall us getting any of that. No, I don't. I don't remember getting anything from. Uh, maybe some from Paul Check because Paul Check goes pretty hard. I mean, I, I do recall some stuff from him, but I do find that it's interesting that when someone like Bishop Barron who comes on there. Which, by the way, I'm not Catholic well, or anything, but it's funny when you see that. It's yeah, because I, it's politically uh, incorrect to criticize uh, uh, other religions and practices, but Christianity, at least in America, it's not politically incorrect. You can do it openly and not get hammered for it. I think a lot of it has to do with people's personal experiences and maybe, you know, the way that they grow up or, you know, friends or people that they've had and, you know, maybe they've had a poor experience in terms of being evangelized to and like when sure. they didn't want to. Or, That's a good point. Uh, you know, things like that. But uh, like to me, like you also have to look at that type of experience in different directions, different ideologies exist out there. And all I see right now is a bunch of ideologies being hammered on us just the same way that used to piss people off uh, when, you know, they're telling them they're going to hell. It feels that way with a lot of these movements and these justice movements. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, there's just a couple things I think that are important to look at. Number one is, uh, and I, this is a fascinating one, and you can do this with other practices, if you want to find a universal truth, uh, one of the best ways to do it is to is to span the globe, look at different practices that have lasted for thousands of years, and then find commonalities, right? So Buddhism, for example, practices uh, detachment, right? Detachment from worldly things. In Christianity, uh, they, they do that as well, but they talk about it a little differently, like just worshiping God and not worshiping anything uh, that's, that's worldly. Bishop Barron talked about that in that episode. You see this in many different practices. Love, for example. Love being like the pinnacle value, the most important thing. You find that in, I think, most or not all popular spiritual practices. So the spiritual truth in all of them. So you don't have to be religious. You don't have to believe in the mysticism aspect of it. You could just look and listen to the wisdom. And then I get this pushback. Like, what do you mean it's wisdom? Well, you know, here's the deal. You talk to the average person, you ask them if they believe in evolution and they'll say, yeah, I believe in evolution. You ask them why. Oh, we have evidence of it. We see that bacteria evolves. We see that viruses evolve. We see some evidence that animals evolve. There's also the same process happens with ideas, evolution of ideas. If ideas have lasted for thousands of years, have been practiced by billions and billions of people over long periods of time, have influenced major parts of the world, then those ideas have some truth in them. They have stood the test of evolution. And I think it's super arrogant when we think we know better. Like you just like, you know, you just discredit it. Ah, it's old, stupid thinking. Like like I'm somehow more wise than thousands and thousands of years and billions of people who've been practicing, you know, these these practices or have these ideas who have found truth in them. And so I think that's the, I think people need to look at this stuff this way. Well, I also think it triggers some people because they, they don't know the full context and your, your full story. And they, and they jump in right now and they don't know that because you happen to be one of those arrogant guys. Oh, I was, I was, you a, were one of those guys that came from that angle that I was a staunch atheist, a staunch atheist. Uh, and I got there through study and all that stuff. And, uh, so I know, I know kind of where that comes from, but eventually when I got to the point where I, I was exactly that, I yeah. said, man, I'm being very arrogant. Like, you know, if these if these practices that have these common truths, these commonalities, if if all these spiritual practices, these major ones, talk about detachment from worldly things, for example, and which and and it's lasted for thousands of years, like maybe I should not be so arrogant and think that I know better. Let me just and let me look and see what the wisdom is, and that's how I kind of opened up to learning about this stuff. You know, yeah. so mm-hmm. so I think that's an important thing. And let's also look here. Here's the deal: health, 
take it. There's a lot of things that make up health. Well, now we're experts in the, the fitness exercise and diet aspect of it. That's the expertise. But uh, is spiritual health a big part of health? Absolutely, man. You mm-hmm. can be fit as hell, eat perfectly, have poor spiritual health, and you will have poor health. Yeah, just acknowledging you don't have all the answers, I think, is a healthy practice. Uh, you know, we could just get into learning a lot, and it's great to learn and, and be confident in the fact that, uh, you know, you're educated and you've got to a, a pretty high level of education. But at the same time, you also have to acknowledge that you're a very small speck in this universe. Yeah, dude. And I lo- and Bishop Barron, I mean, he has to be the most... Like I have never talked to somebody that. Oh, bro, he takes on any anybody. Like if you want to debate and have a discussion with him, he's talks, so smart. Yeah, like, he, addre- he'll, he'll, he addresses. He quotes authors and <laughs> philosophers and history. Like he's like a like a literal Google in yeah, his brain. Yeah, he's a scholar. It's crazy. Now, yeah. it, has him and uh, did him and Sam Sam Harris ever sit down? That's a good question. I would be yeah, wonderful. What a great. That. That would be such a great discussion, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, I think they awesome. have. I'll have to look it up. I thought they did. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. They would be a fun one. Because Sam is. Harris is great. You know, he's he objective. He's open for discussion and debate. I would love watching that. Now, yeah. I, I hear his history. He was a, I don't I don't know if it was Christian. I know he like traveled the world when he was younger. And I know he studied like multiple different religions. And I thought he was like hardcore religious when he was younger and then went atheist as he got older. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But I know he did a tour with uh, Jordan Peterson where they discussed uh, oh, some yeah. of the stuff. The yeah, I've, yeah, I've listened to the I two of them all talk those. about it great. all the time. I love that stuff, man. I love it. Like, let's talk. Let's let's hear. Yeah, and, deep conversations just trying to, you know, figure things out. Well, oh, it's dude. one of the, uh, you know, it's one of the no-nos, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, the politics, religion, you know, like, to, <laughs> the, the, the no dinner table talks. But, you know, I feel like with long-form conversations like this Mm -hmm. i feel like it's opened the door for more conversations like that that we totally didn't have before totally 100 percent, 100 percent agree you know what it is is if you talk about anything that people identify too strongly with that's when you run the risk of the like yeah you get the backlash yes dude yeah it's just inevitable i mean in our space it's diet you know you talk to like you get like a oh god yeah a carnivore you know fanatic in the same room with Uh. a vegan and say, hey, would you guys like to talk uh, about that's diet? just as dogmatic for sure. It's funny. I was just thinking, like, you know, people that like their pizza toppings, and this kind of brought it up. Like, I finally found out who created your ultimate nemesis, Sal. Oh, uh, Hawaiian pizza. The Hawaiian pizza is it was, it was the a, origin. It was a Greek Canadian guy. Oh man, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just I'll pi- find out his name for you in the next podcast. Dude, I'll let you pineapple know. Pineapple on pizza. Oh, my God, <laughs> I know. Dude. I don't get it either. I I like Canadian bacon though. I'm a fan of that. But the pineapple uh, edition was not uh, welcomed. Well, yeah, because it's a meat. But like, yeah, but it goes pineapple goes great on ham. <sighs> yeah, okay, but uh, not on pizza. <laughs> It's savory. I mean, I'm not. I don't know. I, this gets them all fired I know up. That's why I, I like, to, really, I like yeah. to poke at it, but I don't have a dog in this fight because I don't like. Do you like Hawaiian pizza? No, I don't. I'm a I'm a traditional pepperoni guy. I don't like anything else. See, that's why I like. Uh, you maybe, guys. Yeah, yeah. maybe a little yeah, combination yeah, yeah. every now. You and then. guys are good. You got your heads on straight, dude. Yeah. You got, do you guys know that that Screech died? Oh, oh, I did hear that. How? Oh, oh cancer. Man. Yeah, totally what? Bummer. Yeah, he was young, wasn't he? Forty four. Forty four. Forty four. What kind of cancer? Oh, it was uh, malignant. It was a type of melanoma. I think it was a skin cancer of some type. Maybe Doug can mm-hmm. find out. Uh, but uh, he he got diagnosed and within three weeks died. Wow. That's how aggressive the cancer was. Wow. 44. You know what's crazy about this? We are now getting to the age where we're going to start to see people die who are around our age. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Like, yeah, dude. how morbid is that? Lung no. cancer. Oh, it was lung cancer. Ah, wow. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, he was a big part. Like, I always, wow. my brother looked a lot like him, and I think I might have mentioned this at one point, but he had, like, the curly hair, and he was, like, nerdy and whatnot. Uh, I can't tell you how many fights I got into because, they, like, people call him Screech. So, you know, like, uh, now he's gone. Yeah, dude. Didn't he get into some weird shit after yeah. Saved by the Bell? Yeah, he, he, did, did a porn. he did a porn, and then he he did uh, celebrity boxing with Danny Badaducci. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's How do you right. know that random shit, dude? Yeah. Like, again, man, it's useless shit. It's, it's, yeah. dude, it's, you know, it's all in there. Yeah, what, it, what are you subscribing to? I want to see. <laughs> <it's> <laughs> obviously you know, nothing you guys Here's are. the thing about Justin. I have something in common with Justin. We both, he also has a, uh, a, a like a- It's a, what I'm interested in. A sharp memory about certain things. Yeah, yeah. he does. He, he just come up with it. You yeah, know. commercials or random shit yeah. like that. That's so like, perfect for podcasting. You were yeah, made for the shit, bro. Super <laughs> random. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm all about. But that is crazy though, dude. 44 years old, man. Wow, that's got to be- like, Could you imagine having to face your own mortality? right around the corner, man. you imagine that? You had to face it. Like, you go to the doctor and they're like, oh, you're terminal. 
Yeah. At this age, I'm like, uh. Heavy smoker? Was he a heavy smoker? That's a good question. Oh, I don't know. You don't know that? Oh. Dude, I know somebody that died young from lung cancer, never smoked a cigarette in her life. Really? Yes. How annoying would that be? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Work, maybe? What you worked in? What, inhaling or something? Nope. Weird. Nope. They just got lung cancer. Yeah. That's I weird. know. Isn't this brutal? That yeah. sucks. Yeah, I hope yeah. we can cure it one day. Oh. Come on, scientists. Yeah. Get on it, man. Anyway, uh, workout update. How's the workout nutrition going for you, for you guys? I know we're on this uh, this mission to yeah, it's still get consistent. Um, it's things are progressing. I've uh, you know uh, talked about my whey protein intake and whatnot for the mornings, but also like before we do podcast now, like that's my my ritual is uh, besides caffeine, I'm trying to kind of taper a little bit back from caffeine, but then add pure because it's you know I get you stimulants from that, but I feel a lot sharper that way. So that's been a, a regular thing for me. Uh, we fell off of that. That was like a traditional thing that Sal used to make that for us right before. What happened? I, I, I still. I love it, dude. I like, take it I've been doing it like consistently. Oh, okay, I get it. I just so got I'm, sick of so doing I'm out the loop here. Huh? I got sick of yeah, all your shit for you. They're like uh, Adam. <laughs> yeah, he like, needs. I don't yeah, get you appreciate. To, I mean, you. I was like a thing, right? Every morning you'd come in, you'd throw our little mini water bottle over to us with our pure, and yeah. then we would drink it before we get on the podcast. And I, I just felt like I wasn't getting appreciated, so I'm like, I'm not do this <laughs> I, keep, I keep giving them their their supplements. For oh, them. dude, I love I, that stuff, man. Oh, dude, it's my favorite product of theirs. I mean, I know the green juice is great, and it's like their you know crown jewel product and all that but like honestly pure for me uh it like i 100 percent feel sharper when i take you it. know what i love i love that they do the individual packets that to me is like so convenient so can i would i am terrible i don't know about it's probably not south south carries like a whole person <laughs> Stuff with him, right? <laughs> What's so, in the bag? Did yeah. you already? Did you already reveal that no, yet? By the no. way, yeah, you come on, man. We can do that. I, I got, I got a bunch for. Yeah, it. please so answer sure it got. so we don't keep getting these questions. No, nobody will ever know. But I don't like. So I'm. If I have to scoop it up, scoop it out in powder form and mix it, I can maybe do one or two supplements a day like that. But if I got a bunch of things like that, I just. Mm. I don't know. I'm less likely to do it versus like a little packet that I could drop into a water bottle and shake it up. Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, yeah, so I was going to ask you, Adam, uh, with your workouts, because I know you said you, you hurt your back or something. Or you... Ah, bro. I am, uh, yeah, no, I'm. I'm uh, falling apart over there. Or uh, yeah, you know, I need, to back off, I need to back off a little bit, right? I think I mentioned this in a, a recent podcast that I've been trying to scale back on the volume. Uh, my body's talking to me for sure. And I mean, what I was doing and nutritionally originally, I think I, I shared this was. I was not trying to cut. I was uh, I was eating when I'm hungry, just going after my protein intake. So my my calories, um, even though I'm not tracking, I would I would estimate them like in the probably low to mid three thousands, which is not really high for me. But I guess it is because I'm not I'm not moving. I mean, my workout is my activity for the day. The rest of the day, I've, I've been very sedentary lately. I'm not getting my walks in like we uh, like we used to on a regular basis. Other than walking the dogs, like I'm not really getting anything like any steps in every day. Mm -hmm. So I've just been putting on size, and I've been leaning out a tiny bit, but I've definitely been putting size on, and I'm I'm maintaining over 230. And now I'm at that point where my body just starts talking to me. Like uh, the last two leg workouts. I just I went in and I felt something pop on one day. Then I was doing my back pull ups the other day and kind of jerked myself up and felt something pull in my upper back. And this is what starts to happen when I carry myself over that two thirty for an extended period of time. My body just reminds me that it, as much as I th like being thick and full like that, it doesn't it doesn't move. There's well. definitely something to be said because I'm like that too. Uh, I'm I two twenty for me is just it's just too heavy. I don't have a frame. I'm not like just Justin's got a bigger frame, right? Yeah. So he could walk around at 220, Hoss probably frame. feel comfortable. For me to walk around at 220, I have to have a lot of muscle on my body and be very lean. And be very lean, which I've never been 220 lean. I've yeah. always been 220 with, you know, probably 13% body fat or whatever. Hmm. Um and I could feel it too. I'm just it's just too much, too much weight. For me ideally, I, you know, between 195 to 205 is probably my my good muscular weight. What's what, what's yours? Like two, yeah, I'd say two fifteen to two twenty. Like is right around where. So I you're not that far. Yeah, I'm not that far off. And that's and why I think it's bothering me so much is because I'm still a little soft and I'm thick, right? So I think if I was leaner, I'd feel okay, right? So I don't necessarily need to like cut a bunch of weight and and lose a bunch of muscle. I just I need to lean out a bit. I need to lean out, maybe drop five to eight pounds, I think that I would probably feel a lot better. I actually kind of thought I was, to be honest. I wasn't, because I haven't been really checking the scale. I've just been eating how I told you guys. I've been feeling better. I can tell that I'm looking different. I feel like I'm looking better. And so I haven't really, you know, I was like, oh, I'm probably dropping some body fat. I'm building some muscle, which I am, 
but I thought I would have, have lost a little bit more weight than what I have. Based did, off did of you how, lose anything? No, I've been holding right at 230. Bro, we're so sedentary. That's yeah. part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is because I'm not eating that much. Normally, if I I used to lose weight on 3,000 calories. Now, of course, that was in the peak of my competing and training and must I had a ton more lean body mass on me and I was moving a lot more we'll get that rower and assault bike in the uh, studio yeah I'm, I'm gonna, gonna move my row I am gonna move my rower over to the studio and that's the goal right so the goal is I, I'm gonna uh, for sure by the time I move right so I'm moving in 20 days so when I by oh, the yeah, time, it's official right yeah yeah yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so we had it we're, we're gonna be leaving uh this will be interesting I'm gonna commute like Justin I've never commuted to work in my life before um, but I'm I want to be by the water, so I'm 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 heading over to the coast, and I'm going to live over there. Um, we'll see what that looks like. Yeah. Katrina and I both agreed that uh, it's it's one of, it's near one of our favorite places, uh, and so we've thought, okay, let's see what it's like. I'm the one who has to do the commuting, so um, I also like. I like to drive. You guys know that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we've been hanging out together. There's nothing all... wrong with driving, then. Yeah, I drive all. The t- I drive us everywhere oh, we go. Podcasts cause... and audiobooks, man. This is and... where I get all. You know, I, uh, that's my time. You well, know, and that's just it. I haven't been doing that consistently. Like I, I'm normally really good about uh, knocking books out and been really inconsistent with reading myself. And so I want to get back into the audiobooks and the hour. You know, our 45 minute drive that I'll have. I think that that will be a time that'll do it. So I'm really curious to see how I how I if I like it or not. Yeah, so. you know what's funny is uh, I love the beach. I think living near the water would be awesome. But I don't know if you guys know this. I have this weird fear of there being a tsunami. Did I ever tell you guys about this? <laughs> really? So yeah. sleeping like you know like being near the beach and sleeping in a place where I feel like if there was a tsunami I'd be screwed. Yeah, would probably mess with me too much. Well, how are you at sanctuary? <laughs> it's a day or two. How are but- you with earthquakes? Earthquakes, they don't bother they me. They can hit you anywhere. But if I'm near the water and there's an earthquake, yeah, uh, yeah I'm definitely, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely. Well, crying. that did. Ha- I mean, that happened in the Santa Cruz Harbor. Like we got like trickled in, uh, like a mini tsunami that came in and lifted all the boats up and caused a ruckus. But that was it. It was just like smash some boats. Dude, it's it's one of my. It would be. It's like one of my weird fears. Uh, yeah. like <laughs> being woken up in the middle of the night by the ocean. <laughs> no, so you like get up on the mountain. You can still see the ocean, the beach. You drive down a little five. Yeah, minutes that one. Perfect. That one doesn't scare me too because what, th- there's uh, signs of that well before it hits you. Yeah. Right? Like you see like a storm of brewing, right? Like in the winds picking up and the waves getting crazy. It's not like all of a sudden it's like you calm, you know, quiet ocean. What do you mean? The- That's what happened in uh, Indonesia or whatever with the earthquake. It was an earthquake off the shore. Nobody knew. And then all of a sudden they're like, "Where's? Why is the ocean going all the way back? Why is it low tide?" Oh shit! I thought I saw video clips of that, and there was people 20, 30 minutes before that they, they could have evacuated. Yeah, they, there, was there was like stayed. it was crazy storming before it hit. No, it, was, it wasn't yes. a storm. It was a sunny day. No. Doug, am I, am I tripping? I don't think there's anything with the weather that has to do with tsunami. No, that's an earthquake. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, but you still don't feel it coming. No, you don't no. at all. No. Remember, Doug lived in Japan. No, there has to be like some kind of siren that uh, gives them warning. Well, I think a lot of them do. Ha- cities in Japan have sirens, for yeah. sure. But no, I think it can be a beautiful sunny day. You have no idea other than, like Sal said, the tide goes out dramatically. Yep. And that's an indication that something big's coming down. Yeah, look what happened in Japan. These are people who are prepared oh, for tsunamis all the time. Well, it's like, happened there multiple times. And I thought and I people, watched a whole video video documentary on that, and I thought I saw people that were like hanging out still at their house. They saw it come in. It was getting all stormy right before it got there. No. I'm not uh, something else. Then, I huh? mean, storms can cause swells where water will come in, mm-hmm. but it's the earthquake that causes where the, the, you know, the plates shift. So you get the shifting, and the water just all of a sudden yeah. moves in one direction. And, uh, I mean, again, in Japan, people got caught off guard and Japan is like the most tsunami, like they're, they're well known for. Yeah, it's a hot spot for them. Yes. Yeah. And people got caught Dude, in The Pacific coast. Is I'm not, scared. Not really a hot spot for those. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not They've tripping. had tsunamis on the Pacific coast. Yeah. Tiny ones. Really? Yeah. Nothing crazy. I thought they did in 1960. Like, like, yeah. Like 1820 or something. <laughs> oh, no. Doug, look up. Know. Look I up. Yeah, that, I don't know. That's West true. coast, well, okay, California. Okay. So what, what is it? Okay. Everybody, what's your, uh, of all of us, what's your, your, uh, your natural disaster you're most afraid of? Uh, oh, mm. tsunami for me. Yeah, tsunami. earthquake for me actually, and we live in it, which is interesting, right? Yeah, like, I don't know. Earthquakes never. I don't know. I guess it's because I had like a a good experience with the earthquake, if I could say it. it's like I was like riding it. Uh, you know, I, I was able. I was actually outside playing soccer, and then I saw it coming because of the ripples in the ground. Yeah, and it tripped me out. And I actually had, I don't know. I was a kid. I had fun with it, so I have a different association with that. But uh, I think. Um, 
I'm trying to think of what uh, it would be like. Probably, probably like a, I don't know, dude. Cutting a fire, maybe. Uh, yeah. Wow. Like, yeah. Wow. Fire. You were almost there. I mean, I mean, I'm trying I mean to, it's, for me, it, earthquake. It, it, here's why earthquake for me because and be, and we grow up in this. So I've I've been in you a lot bad of balance. So no, like because <laughs> if it was a big one and I was in a building, volcano like, explosion, you're fucked. Like, like a you super talk about volcano. the 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 tsunami. I feel like at least you got a few more minutes than an earth, earthquake. You're in the middle of a building and yeah. it goes down or it's starting to shake. It's a seven plus. Okay, yeah. how would you rather be woken up in the middle of night, earthquake or fucking water coming through your door? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, dude. Well, you're at the point where. You're saying it's there to you. I, f I feel like you got a little bit of a warning time. Yeah. Well, so, okay, by the way, what did I say? The last time the West Coast had a big yeah. tsunami was sometime in the 60s. Yeah. 19, March 28, 1964, the West Coast's most devastating tsunami on record was generated by a deadly magnitude 9.2 quake off Alaska. It caused powerful waves that slammed coastal areas, including the Northern California community of Crescent City, where 11 people were killed. Well, See, told you. So well, that was we're not the city. That was way up there. We're not safe. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. No. Yeah, we're we're fine. Our first question is from Heather from California. Hey, Heather, how can we help you out? Hi, Sal. How's it going? Good. How are um, you? I uh, I recently found out I have hypothyroidism, and I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on uh, natural interventions versus like synthetic hormones and pharmaceutical treatments. I uh, just wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Okay, so um, you got diagnosed by a doctor that you're not. Yes, correct. Okay, and and to, to be clear, you said hypo, not enough hypo. thyroid. Hypo, yes. Okay. Um, okay, so obviously, first off, uh, I'm not a doctor. I'm I'm uh, just been a trainer for a long time. I've worked with a lot of people. I've worked with a lot of functional medicine He's just practitioners. A smart guy. <laughs> so I'll I'll comment from that uh, position. Okay. Um, and by, by the way, did you get tested for antibodies uh, or uh, anything else regard uh, in relation to your thyroid? Correct, correct. And this has been a continual testing, um, probably over the last like nine months or so. Okay. So, um, functional medicine practitioners sometimes will have somebody do, you know, elimination diet. They may recommend supplements like ashwagandha. Um, but you know, here's the thing. And I also worked with a lot of doctors and I would talk to them often about, uh, thyroid issues. Hypothyroidism, if it's just too little thyroid is a pretty, uh, from a Western medicine standpoint, pretty easy to fix situation. Um, you just take, thyroid medication. The challenge becomes uh, when you're taking the thyroid is is figuring out the right amount mm -hmm. for you because oftentimes you'll start it and then you'll get the effects of feeling like you have too much or too little. This process can take you know six months to a year to really figure out the right dose. But aside from that, it's a pretty easy fix and you don't want to go too long with too little thyroid um, because it's, uh, it's pretty bad for your health and your overall quality of life as you've probably already experienced Low energy, slow metabolism, that kind of stuff. How are how are stimulants going to affect her? Like caffeine and things like that pre workout. Typically, someone who's hypothyroid. That's a good question too. I would assume you probably have been trying to self medicate with a lot of caffeine. Um, I try to stay away from caffeine as much as possible, but there were some times when I was feeling like extra lethargic and uh, definitely was doing a lot more uh, coffee. I try not to break like coffee after 1 p.m., but I was starting to do it like 3 o'clock in the afternoon because I was just dragging some days. Yeah. Did, by any chance, did you practice a, a ketogenic or really low-carb diet for a long time? No, I did not. Okay. And I've never been like vegan vegetarian or anything like that either because I know sometimes like B12 deficiency wow. can uh, can be a part of this. Yeah. And in low, like keto diets practiced for long periods of times in women uh, sometimes will show up uh, with thyroid issues. That's why I asked that question. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the best thing I can recommend is to follow your doctor's advice and to train appropriately. So you're going to have to kind of listen to your body, which means you might not be able to train very intensely or very often because your energy's you know, probably not going to be yeah. great until you get the, the right amount of thyroid. Um, you also, you know, there's, there's different types of medications um, that you can work with um, when it comes to your thyroid. So, you know, Synthroid is, I think, the most common uh, yeah. thyroid medication. Um, and then you can do, you know, like, I, I believe they do like bioidentical type uh, thyroid type stuff. Um, so, you know, you can explore that kind of stuff. But, you know, from a diet and exercise standpoint, it's tough because you don't want to go too long with low thyroid. It really, it really affects your quality of life in a negative way. Um, is I'm, I'm sure you've probably experienced. Yeah. 
yeah, honestly, it was a it was a pretty big decline in my health. I'm a very healthy person overall. Um, I um, have a degree in kinesiology, sports medicine, and uh, nutrition, and I'm also a personal trainer. So, like, I I take care of my body really well, and um, I was started getting some cues and went to my doctor right away. Um, and we've been kind of figuring it out over the last few months. Um, what's been going on with me. That's cool. And it, it, were you noticing the brain fog, uh, like the lack of uh, being able to concentrate, that kind of stuff? Yeah, what? totally. Okay. Um, I'm one to have a really good memory and I was really forgetting stuff. Um, it was it was really bad. And I was like, is this just me aging? You know, <laughs> it was, mm-hmm. um, and then it, it was, but it, it I could definitely tell something was off. Did you have any kids by chance? Just curious. No. Okay. No what's, a tra- what's the training protocol look like? How are you training right now? Um, I am doing, um, I'm actually, uh, uh, doing, uh, MAPS anabolic right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's great, probably great the, yeah, program. I would say that's probably the, the, the perfect program, uh, for yeah, you right now. Just putting myself in three days a week, I think is what's kind of just fitting in with my energy levels right now. Um, because before I was training like more like four or five times a week and I was, I was basically wearing myself then at that yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to hormones, here's the deal. Um, you know, you can do things naturally to try to balance out hormones, but in certain cases, um, the, the, the low amounts of hormones themselves pose a greater risk to your health. So like, uh, you know, men with low testosterone, for example, they can try raising their testosterone naturally. Sometimes they're successful, but if they're not, then taking testosterone is better for their health than saying, I just want to be, you know, natural type of deal. So Thyroid is one of those, and it's it's you know from what I've from what I understand from the hormone doctors I've worked with and trained, you know they're like, look, this is one that you can just take the thyroid, not a big deal, and it makes a tremendous improvement in the person's health and quality of life. It's an area I've never messed with. Mm. I mean, I, I've had lots of clients, and it's just one of those ones that they just they take the medication. I've worked around it with the doctor. Mm-hmm. I've never tried to do anything holistically to change it. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. I just I just wanted your guys' input because I've heard a lot of stuff and I've researched myself. So Sal, Adam, Justin, and Doug, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking my question. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, take care, guys. Yeah, that one's uh, uh, a bit over it's, my pay grade because I, I and I had a lot of clients that had thyroid issues, but it wasn't something that I ever messed with. It was something that whatever your doctor is telling you as far as medication, we're going to follow. I know little things like the question I was asking mm-hmm. with caffeine, how hard she's training, like mm-hmm. those types of adjustments I would know to make. Uh, but as far as, you know, when you're starting, when you get into hormones, it's not something that I feel yeah. like that I, I can really mm-hmm. control. I've been, very much. yeah, dealing with this quite a bit with Courtney, uh, uh, you know, with, with her thyroid and just trying to get the medication, like you had mentioned, with just getting that right, the right dose. Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes a while. And I think that it's frustrating uh, because, uh, you know, you have, you have to actually wait and be patient for a while before it all kind of like balances out. But uh, once it does, it's pretty dramatic, uh, you know, what kind of happens. So. Oh, dude, it's, uh, you know, that's why I asked her about antibodies. Like sometimes people will have, have, uh, like autoimmune reactions to their own thyroid, and this will cause them to have symptoms of low thyroid, but they're producing ac- adequate thyroid hormone. It's just they have all these antibodies. So Hashimoto's is an example of something like that. In those cases, some, from my experience, sometimes holistic measures can make a tremendous improvement by helping your body's own immune system regulate itself better. Yeah, but, but what do you mean by holistic measures? You mean like cutting out maybe inflammatory foods, reducing the mm. intensity of training, maybe cutting out caffeine and stimulants? Like yeah, what looking else? At, like I, I wouldn't know where else to go. Looking at food intolerances, some SIBO, SIBO uh, sometimes can yeah. cause issues like that, so treating SIBO. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if you just have low thyroid, you know, uh, okay, and I, and I totally respect it when people want to do things on their own and naturally. Give it a little bit of time. If it's not working, Take the hormone because having low thyroid is not good for you. It's just not good for your health at all. And then right. later on, if she, you know, Justin asked if she had any kids, she said no. If she wanted to have kids, if she was pregnant with low thyroid, that can cause major problems yeah. uh, for the baby as well. So mm. it's not one of those that you want to, you know, necessarily, you know, just put to the side and say, screw it, I'm just going to be natural. If it's low, your quality of life is yeah. just terrible. Well, especially when you're talking about someone like that, like all the questions we're asking, I mean, she obviously knows what she's doing and she's researched a little mm-hmm. bit herself and she's taking care of herself health wise so th- i didn't see any like obvious things like oh i'm abusing caffeine or i'm training seven days a week super intense or marathon running or anything that i thought that might be throwing her hormones off she yeah. sounds like she's got pretty good balance already so i would have drove her right back to her doctor mm-hmm. our next caller is adam from ohio hey adam how can we help you 
Hey guys, I had a question. Um, so my question was, if I have goals for both strength progression and aesthetics, is it better to focus on one at a time or would it be better to uh, tackle them simultaneously? Well, okay, so... Uh, better is hard to say, right? Yeah, that's a yeah. great question because both those goals uh, translate well to each other. Working on strength oftentimes will improve aesthetics, and working on aesthetics, uh, at least the the, uh, the way you train for aesthetics, sometimes or oftentimes helps with strength because it helps you focus on you know, weaker body parts and connecting to certain movements and mm -hmm. focusing on form and the squeeze and the pump. So uh, to answer your question, uh, I think it's always best to train in phases. This is just from my own experience. So I don't think training, you know, let's say you worked out, you know, four days a week, two of those days are strength, two of those days are aesthetic. You're probably better off, again, this is based on my experience training lots of people, doing a three or four week phase of each. So three or four weeks of strength followed by three or four weeks of aesthetic, you know, maybe bodybuilding style training. Mm. Uh, there's a recent study that came out that actually supports what I'm talking about as well. They showed that people who did it that way got better results. And it, you'll find in a lot of our MAPS programs, we tend we, we put things in phases uh, because, again, we find that to be the most effective way to do it. Yeah, well, it's hard to say best, right? Because what's best is whatever you'll do the most consistently, right? So it's hard to say that... Um, one way is better than the other. I, I just I, I've found with clients that I've trained that it's easier for us to to focus on one thing at a time than blending. It's real similar to like the question where people ask like, um, you know, like in a workout where you'll have you know half the exercises you're doing in the fifteen to twenty rep range, and then the other half of the exercises you're doing in the you know low you know five rep range for like strength building. Uh, can you do that and can you get great results? Sure, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, and if you enjoy lifting that way. But I like organizing it where it's like, okay, we are focused all on strength for the next three to five weeks. And then, okay, now we're really focused on hypertrophy and the pump and chasing that. I just personally find that I've had more success with clients and myself that way. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't do it uh, the other way. Yeah. Adam, do you have, are, are you following any MAPS programs right now? I'm not following any MAPS programs. Um, I've just kind of been tinkering with my own upper lower uh, and I have been trying to phase it out, but uh, this question kind of came up as I was working on that, um, just as far as what kind of blocks or phases I should be running. Hmm. Well, what, tell me, what are you most inclined to do? Like typically, like you, you like the splits, you like bodybuilder style training the most, like what are you most compelled I'm, I to mean, do? I mean, I've tried it all, um, but I have really leaned more towards uh, the split training. I think that that's, that's really where my interest has kind of landed we just like to kind of you know, challenge that a little bit and see if maybe you could try a new stimulus uh, a lot of times the body will respond in ways uh, you'd be surprised uh just by shifting into a completely different style of adaptation and so to to take you into more of a strength phase might actually be uh you know a great start for you well adam i'm gonna i'm gonna gift you a maps program but i need to know a little bit more about you before i can make the right recommendation how long have you consistently been lifting weights? Oh, consistently, I'd say probably about the last three or so years. Okay, so three years, your recovery is probably pretty good. Um, I would recommend MAPS Aesthetic, and here's why. In MAPS Aesthetic, the first block, the first phase is strength. It is an aesthetic-focused, obviously, the name of it is MAPS Aesthetic, an aesthetic-focused uh, MAPS program. So it is bodybuilder driven, but there is a strength block in the beginning. Phase one is about getting stronger. Um, I think you would do really well with that program. So I we're going to, we're going to set mm -hmm. you up with that for free and I'd like you to follow it. Only then, if you'll follow it though, Adam, are you going to follow it? Yeah, that sounds amazing. Guys. Okay. Thank I, you so much. Okay. No problem. And then I'd left some feedback after you followed the program, make sure you take some before and after pictures. I think you'll be blown away, uh, at the changes your body goes through when you follow something that's really well programmed. Absolutely. Hey, thank you guys so much for this. No awesome. Pro no problem. No problem, Sweet. man. Thanks for calling. I hate telling people that something is better than something else when it comes to like programs. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because again, we're all tools to get you. Something. Right. And we, and we've talked about this before, right? Like uh, it's, 
a subpar program done consistently will still always outperform the best program done inconsistently. Right. So if there's a, a, a modality of training or like the, a program that he follows that he likes that he stays consistent with, even if it's not the most ideal for him to see the most results, uh, but he's the most consistent with it, then that may be better for him. So I always have a hard time telling somebody like this is better. Um, but I also have experienced with my clients and myself that when we have a focus, when the, the, the goal is, okay, even if you want to, I want to look good, I want to lose this weight, I want to mm -hmm. be stronger, I wanna, you have all these main goals, but your main, we focus on one of those goals at a time, and we build our program, we build our mindset, we build our diet all around that, and then we move to the next part of your goal. I just have found that they've had way more success, and I feel like it's much easier to measure whatever it is that you're doing, what is working the best for you. When you kind of throw it all at it, when yeah. you're like, oh, I want to do mobility, strength, and I and I want to do hypertrophy all, at, all together, all in the same program, all in the same week, all in the same month, it's kind of hard to tease out, well, what was working really well for me? Totally, yeah. and, and the big one for me is the mindset. Okay, there's a totally different mindset when you're going into a workout, focusing on moving the most weight, right. utilizing versus the pump movement and leverage versus uh, going in there to isolate and feel a muscle squeeze and stretch and connect versus working on mobility or athletic performance, for example. Mm -hmm. All of those are totally different mindsets. So for me personally, switching up the mindsets within a workout or within a week, I just am not as effective because honestly, yeah. the mindset doesn't solidify and set in until like the second week. Plus, it you takes get better long. at it from a skill perspective. Absolutely, absolutely. So phasing, uh, you know, is in, in in my opinion superior. All things being equal, Adam. Of course, if he loves working out the other way, you're totally right. Like, don't do something else because it's better. Even you know when you don't like it, because that means you won't do it. Right? Do you feel the same way, Justin? I mean, I know you sometimes will do your strength training and then a Zumba class the next day. Like yeah. Zumba, oh, you... Zumba really shakes it up. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, he does. He does strength based Zumba though. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's low reps. That's why you see these hips. They don't lie. Our next caller is Chris from Minnesota. Hey, what's up, Chris? How can we help you? Hey guys, it's really cool to be able to talk to you. Thanks for thanks for having me. Hey, listen, my question is a, a mobility slash uh, just kind of core strength question, which is during the quarantine, I really was trying to work on just being less stiff as a board. And um, that involves some single leg stuff. And I didn't have a lot of equipment, so it was bands. And one of the things I, I got into a little bit was um, trying the overhead squat with a band. Um, and it just the connection I felt to my core and just the way it made me feel was really awesome actually i just i felt two or three inches taller but i really can't load that because i have a some shoulder mobility issues so i'm looking for other exercises other things to do that kind of recreate that same feeling that i'm always trying to battle with to become more mobile because you know i sit in a, a desk chair all day so i'm looking for ideas so uh, my question would be uh First, let's figure out what the limiting factor is, right? Like, what is it? You think it's your shoulders that aren't allowing you to kind of retract to get down in that position? Yeah, I have a really bad arthritis in my left shoulder. So, you know, I have to modify a lot of the things um, as far as overhead pressing. I use a landmine, landmine bar, so I can't really overhead press. So it's not really an option for me to, you know, to, to work on it as best I can. But it's, it's really just my one shoulder that uh, prevents it. How much have you mm. played with the Turkish getup? Uh, not very much. That that's um, that's another great. So, <clears throat> where you're describing kind of where you're at right now is really similar to where I feel I was just about two and a half years ago, where I got on this really hardcore mobility kick. I thought, ah, you know what? I, I did the bodybuilding thing now, and I'm getting older and achy and stiff. And I was on this pursuit to uh, get as mobile as I could in the in the, the shortest period of time, and spent a lot of time doing a lot of like combat stretch hip mobility stuff 90 90 work for myself or zone one and in, in uh, maps prime used a lot of that uh for like our wall test and stuff for uh, thoracic mobility and uh, i actually got to a point where i too could get uh like an an overhead squat but i had a really hard time loading it too just because i didn't have the core strength and stability yet and it, i was still I wasn't uh, super mobile there, and I still had some limiting factors with my my thoracic mobility. 
And so uh, I, the Turkish get up, I feel like because it's uh, unilateral, but yet I get I'm working on very similar areas, even though they the exercise looks different. Um, I felt a, a lot of carry over into that. And that same similar feeling that you just described, like that was one of the things I loved about the overhead squad is like, man, I do even with hardly any weight or just the bar afterwards, I would just feel so much better from that. I get that similar feeling from Turkish get-ups. Yeah, I'll add something to that. I think that's great advice. Um, and I'll add a couple things. Uh, you can practice overhead carries with mm -hmm. nothing too uh, heavy. Another, another great point. Yeah, you know, uh, kettlebell would be good, but make sure it's lighter than you think. Just practice that full extension overhead, packing the shoulder, walking with a braced core, walking nice and straight and tall, carrying something overhead. That'll strengthen that that top position and then windmills uh yeah. you know windmills are great for the you know the, the side of the core but a lot of people don't realize it's also great for shoulder mm -hmm. mobility and i would take your time uh do not try loading the overhead squat if you can't do an overhead press i would try to get good at an overhead press uh first and i would forget the 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 squat uh overhead squat for a little while because it's far more complex mm. there's a lot more moving parts and what you don't want to do is push it so far or too hard to where you actually have to take a few steps back. Yeah, I love those too. And especially if you're doing the overhead carry with a kettlebell, I mean, it could be a light kettlebell, but just because it's loaded on the back of your arm and that being a lot of times limiting factor, uh, being able to, to, to pull your arm up uh, in its full range of motion, it kind of helps to have that loaded uh, somewhat to give you uh, you know, some resistance going in that direction. I also love the, the windmill. I was going to bring that up as well, just because you do have to stabilize your shoulder while you're going going through this thoracic rotation while you're going through all the rest of this uh, motion throughout your body. Uh, it's a good one to really uh, focus on that. And then lastly, too, uh, with the stick, uh, if you could just get like a regular stick, um, it, you could do a lot with that in terms of also just doing like a shoulder dislocate, but you don't have to necessarily go all the way to your lower back. So starting at your stomach and then trying to bring the bar up over your head, just starting with that and then pulling outward. So really creating a lot of tension, extending your elbows and pulling outwardly as you're, you're lifting and raising your arms up over your head will start really to train, you know, those shoulders to respond properly. Chris, have you, have you done a handcuff with rotation too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I've really been into your guys' YouTube videos because um, during quarantine, I got plenty of time and I'm working from home now. So I've done, tried to do a lot of those. Um, I, so they've been super cool. I did your mobility webinar. I can only do about half the stuff, but, um, you know, I just been trying to do a little bit more and, and make it more of a habit. Yeah. Honestly, it was not a habit for many years. And I just, you know, I'm not a athlete. I'm just a guy, just a regular old guy. So trying to use that to supplement some of my lifting has really been beneficial. A lot of the unilateral stuff too, but, um, yeah, I've been trying to do as much of the YouTube stuff that you guys put out it's really helpful yeah reach roll lift thread the needle handcuff rotation zone one those are all like i think an area that i would really put a lot of energy yeah. and effort into before going into the training a lot of the prime tests yeah, yeah. And, and here and look here's okay. a here's the deal with mobility it's best done frequently it's not like strength training where you need to take time off it's uh you're, you're better off doing you know 10 minutes twice a day of targeted mobility work uh, every single right. day. You'll get far better results doing it that way. Don't do mobility work like strength training where it's, you know, twice a week or once a week or whatever. Do it daily, you know, maybe morning and night um, and you'll ex you'll greatly accelerate your progress. Awesome. Thanks, right. guys. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for calling. Yeah, I think the, the big issue with mobility is that uh, people will do like once or twice a week. No, that was good. It, that's yeah. good advice to keep drilling that home. I know we've said it on the show before, but um, I, it, I didn't see the major improvement uh, with myself until it became until I became almost competitive with it, where I was like, "How many times a day can I do this? And how consistently can I do this every day?" Like um, before I started to really notice a difference. If you use mobility as just kind of a way to warm up. It's better than nothing. It's better mm -hmm. than getting on a treadmill. It's better than static stretching uh, for a warm up. So I definitely think it's good. But if you're going to make uh, changes like in your posture, like it's you're trying to work on correctional 
exercise, it's really tough because you have to understand that what got you in that position, what put you in the place of you know, poor shoulder mobility or hip mobility or ankle, whatever it may be, is the habits that you do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And more than likely, you're still doing those habits. So you've got to put in enough work to counter that. And just simply doing it one or one to three times a week is not enough to see. Well, that feeling he just felt from, from being in the proper stacked alignment uh, is something that he should experience more frequently. And so to, to be able to dive back in and put more work in that direction is going to be everything. Our next caller is Angela from California. Hey, Angela, how can we help you? Hi. Um, so my question is, can supination of the feet be corrected? And what kind of priming would help with that? Oh, yeah. Great Absolutely. question. So uh, supinating of the feet, uh, not as common as pronating, but let me just for the audience explain kind of what that is. So supinating is when your ankle turns out. So it be your foot kind of turning up on the inner part, out uh, and down on the outer part. Pronation would be like a flat foot, the opposite, going the opposite what, direction. What do you what do you think is the most common when you when you see that? Because it's rare to see that. You see pronating more than you see supinating. What, when, what kind of client or what type of person that comes to mind when you think of that? Oh, uh, so dancers. Dancer, yeah. Yep, yeah. yeah. I had a few dancers that had that. Yeah, I was trying to think of a sport that where that would cause that. What's, what, what? Dancers is the only time I've really yeah. seen it in a big way. Lots they, of external rotation with their movements. Yeah. Uh, overarching sometimes in the in the in the feet, uh, mm-hmm. I've seen that happen. But um, by any chance, uh, uh, have were you a dancer in the past? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, there goes that idea. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because I like to go clubbing every once yeah. in a while. Does, yeah. that, does that count? <laughs> by the way, how did you figure out that you had excessive supination? Was this diagnosed by a movement specialist, or just something that you noticed yourself? Um, I I first noticed it myself because on my shoes they wear. Um, like drastically on the edges, on the outer edges. Okay. And I have a lot of, I get like a lot of pain and, and, um, and stuff like that in my feet and my knees. And, and so I kind of Googled it and, um, I went to like a, a specialty shoe store as well. Oh yeah, stay away from that shit. They're just going to crutch it. They're going to give you like insoles and yeah. things like that. I but- mean, I guess in the in the uh, in the meantime, it can help with some of the symptoms. But yeah, you got to you got to address yeah. the root cause. Um, so what the, some of the things I would focus on are stretching the calves, the soleus. So these are the muscles of the back of the bottom of the leg. I would work on strengthening the tibialis. Okay, so this is the muscle in the front of the shin. So you could do like toe raises. So not heel raises, but toe raises. To strengthen that, I would also look Combat at your uh, and I would also look at your hips, um, because sometimes, it, well, oftentimes it works up the kinetic chain, and people start to develop problems in their hips where maybe their feet turn out, uh, their hips are a little externally rotated. So I would look at uh, as far up as the hips, maybe do something like ninety ninety. Have you tried anything on your own? Have you found any success? Um, I do. I already do 90-90s um, and I do combat stretches and I do some other things, but not so much for like that area. But I mean, since doing those two movements, I've noticed a huge difference just in my mobility because I couldn't even um, sit Indian style, you know, at one point, my my um, it, my legs had just my knees and just moving I, I just couldn't do a whole lot. And so since doing that, I'm able to um, sit like that or get into certain positions that I haven't been able to do in a long time. That's really good. I'm with Sal. I would definitely uh, drill home the the hip stuff. Even though it's probably stemming from the foot, there could be a lot of stuff that's reinforcing it in the hips. So continuing to progress that. I also have like a little thing. I like to, uh, I don't know if you have a lacrosse ball, um, but I love to get uh, barefoot. And then it's mm. roll the, the the lacrosse ball on the bottom of your foot. So find the real sensitive parts, kind of keep pressure in that area. And then while I have kind of pressure in that area, I also try and like articulate my toes. And that I actually start with that before I go into a combat stretch. Uh, then I get into my combat stretch. And then I like to do things like uh, tippy toe squats or even just working on calf raises barefoot and, and really paying attention to uh, my ankles. So what you'll notice is when we do like a calf raise, when you're barefoot like that, and you if you pronate or supinate, you'll have a tendency to either the the uh, the heels will kick out or they'll collapse inward, and you're trying to keep them neutral. And so just you doing a barefoot 
uh, calf raises and really paying attention to your ankles and not allowing them to kick out or collapse in and stay stabilized. So I would do like a calf raise, stand on my tippy toes and keep my, my ankles neutral, stay up there for like five seconds, come back down. Mm-hmm. And I'd repeat that for like five to 10 reps after I do my lacrosse ball and combat stretch. I think that's a great way to kind of wake up that entire area, strengthen the ankles. And then as you progress that, you can then actually even start to load the body in that position. First, be able to do that with just your body weight, and then you can start to load it. And then you can start to challenge it with strength and stability by doing like tippy toe squats. Yes. So I love to, once I get to a place where I, I have good control of that, I can keep my ankles neutral. I'm up in the uh, uh, up on my toes. Then I'll actually squat down. And I, for me, I'll start with just the you know your body weight first, and then barbell, and then if you can load, uh, that's a great way to kind of and see if you that. can get like a tennis ball that you can hold between oh, yeah, your ankles, great. so you can keep that pressure inward, so you're squeezing in, and also too, in terms of the pressure of your big toe, that being the emphasis, uh, just something as very basic as doing walking patterns in your house barefoot, uh, but really emphasizing the pressure of your big toe to try and reestablish a bit of grounding there. Uh, uh, so you have that sort of triangle of force. So it goes from you know your your pinky toe, your big toe, and then right there where the tongue of your shoe is. So when you're walking, you're raising your heel, you're getting it on that pad of the forefoot, and that's what you're focusing on, uh, reestablishing a better way to 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 move. Something that will put emphasis on that that Justin's talking about uh, is uh, I would take a quarter. And I would put it like when I'm doing these, like the, the calf raises and the tippy toe squats that I'm talking about is I would take a quarter and I'd put it under the, uh, right there underneath the, the fat pad, right? So if you look, think about the triangle that, that Justin's talking about, uh, if you have a tendency to rolling out, I'm putting the quarter under that, the, the upper part, upper the right toe. Yeah. The big toe. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I put the quarter there. So I'm thinking, so you have a little bit of feedback. So as you're doing the, the calf raises and you're getting up on your tippy toes, you're thinking about driving through that quarter since you have a tendency to drive on the outsides of your feet, you're trying to push off the quarter. Yeah. One, one more question. Do you know of anything that you did in the past, uh, like wore lots of high heel shoes, for example, that might've caused this for you? No, I have no idea because um, I don't wear high heeled shoes. I'm not a good dancer. <laughs> I just only maybe the last you know ten years of my life I actually got into fitness. I you know was just not into it before. I just I don't I don't know how how I got this. <laughs> okay, all right. No, no problem. But yeah, all the stuff that we said should help quite a bit. Uh, just, you know, ankle mobility in general uh, and foot mobility in general should make an improvement. But it does take time. Practice frequently. Yep. Yeah. No, thank you. That's awesome. I'm going to look into all of those. Awesome. No problem. Yeah. Less common. Much less common. Way see. less. Yeah. I mean, I can I can count on one hand how many clients I had uh, that actually uh, supinated. I mm-hmm. mean, it's more common that the people pronate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I couldn't even remember what – so for me, I don't think it was a dancer I had. I couldn't remember if it was an athlete or, or what the reason was. You know, I actually – the other one was uh, when sometimes when uh, you're really, really overweight, you'll see that. They kind of they, they they fold out. You'll see it's like somebody who's like hundred plus pounds. Yeah, it's because of the typically the fat mass around their thighs pushes them apart, and it kind of drives that yeah. lateral. So that's the oh, the only times really I see that. Otherwise, it's almost always pronating. This is one of those I could have used the visual and the squat and the movement and the walking sure. and all that. Sure. That would have helped a lot. But yeah, it would have made a big difference. But it's uh, it's still very challenging, and it's uh, it is a very interesting one. People like this often will roll their ankles uh, mm. to the outside. So they, they tend to be more susceptible to that if they ever try to go run or yeah. play tag with their kids. They'll roll their ankles quite often. You know, we didn't, and we didn't actually uh, say this, but this is a type of person too that I would I would I would barefoot train with after a while too. So after we do all the stuff, the prerequisites that we mm-hmm. talked about uh, with lacrosse ball and all the uh, stability, mobility, strength exercises. Then the next phase after that would be all your just basic. I'd have her in the gym and having her doing walking lunges, and I'd be mm-hmm. having her do. I mean, even ba- bicep curl. Everything would be barefoot, and us talking about the position of your feet and like trying to get that triangle going, like evenly, evenly distributed while you do all your training. Mm-hmm. You can listen to Mind Pump on audio and video. Come find us on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. Also, uh, if you'd like to get some free information on fitness, like how to get a better squat build better arms, get a more trimmed and sculpted midsection, go to mindpumpfree.com, download our guides. We've got a lot on there, more than I just uh, mentioned. 
You can get them all and they cost nothing. Again, that's mindpumpfree.com.